What's up, everybody? It's Charles. Today, I'm taking your questions on vacuum systems, firing orders, spark plugs, and more. This is episode 246 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. All right, in order to get a question on a show like this, email me, charles, at humblemechanic.com and put question for Charles in the subject. Ask that question, hit the enter button, then give me the details of said question that makes it a ton easier for me to help out you. And if watching is not your flavor, there are audio-only versions of these and many other videos that I do available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google, and of course at HumbleMechanic.com. All right, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP deals in a ton of OE maintenance and repair parts, timing belt kits, suspension components, and even fluids. In fact, they make the factory DSG fluid for Volkswagen and Audi. So check them out at crpautomotive.com. And real quick, if you want discounts to places like Black Forest, Eastwood, MT Knife, Sonic Tools, Kerma, TDI, Adams Polishes, Scanner Danners, Book My Canic, and a whole bunch more, check out that crew membership program. Great way to support the show, of course, which I appreciate. But more importantly, score yourself some awesome discounts. As always, links are down below. Let's get into the questions. First one comes up from my buddy Scott. How does the vacuum system work on 2.0 TSI? My 2012 Tiguan has the MIL illuminated for the dreaded P2015. However, this intake has approximately 50K on it. When I log measuring block 143 while driving, the intake runner changes state as RPM increases, telling me the intake flap is moving. Visual inspection shows the actuator arm connected and the flap moves freely when moving it by hand. Another symptom I have is hard brake pedal after driving at highway speeds for several minutes, as if there's no vacuum going to the booster. The boost to the brake comes and goes. I wanna diagnose the vacuum system to determine if my vacuum pump has failed. Any other tips for diagnosing this issue? Thanks for all you do for the community, Scott. All right, Scott, great question. So a couple of things. First of all, on that intake manifold, it would not surprise me at all if that manifold was bad again. I have seen multiple cars with multiple failures of the intake manifold. Scott, what you can do real quick is watch that video I did because that part has been updated. That was about a year and a half ago, uh, maybe a little more, a little less, almost two years ago, I guess now, that that's been done. So you're probably not going to have that newest intake manifold installed on your car. If you don't, we wanna get that put on the car, whether you are still under the uh, warranty extension or not, if you got a DIY. It's not the hardest DIY ever to do. What you want to also pay attention to when you're monitoring that fault, or I should say those value blocks, 143, is you want to try and get the intake manifold and vehicle in the same or as close to the same situation as the code was stored. Go into that code, Scott, and look at the requirements for the code being turned on. What was the temperature? What was the RPM? What was the ambient temperature, if you could see that, right? What was the battery voltage? All those things and try and put the car back in that same situation that it was when the fault was stored. That's gonna give you the best results, I guess, uh, when you're trying to diagnose it, or at least it's gonna put the vehicle close to the situation when the fault was stored. Something else you wanna look at too, Scott, is back near where the vacuum pump is, there's a little T piece, a vacuum T piece, and that can get clogged with debris, it can crack, and it can cause that, uh, that P2015. This also may be the reason you're experiencing some of the, uh, the brake assist concerns that you have. Now, I have seen brake boosters fail on Tiguan's before, and typically you can bump the pedal a little bit and you'll hear a very strange sound coming from the booster. We can also have the car running, take the connection off of the booster, and we can either pump it up with a vacuum pump and see if it holds. We can also monitor what the vacuum pump is doing by taking, you'll probably have to use a little rubber adapter because that vacuum port is pretty big and pump it right onto the vacuum pump and see what it's reading. You can change the engine RPM and watch that gauge and see what it does. My guess is that you, pro <laughs> my guess, I have like several guesses for you, Scott. My guess is you probably have another bad intake manifold. That's very, very common. Wouldn't be surprised that it, by that at all. You can also take that vacuum gauge that I mentioned and put it where the vacuum comes into the intake manifold and monitor engine vacuum there. The only problem with doing that both on the pump and at the manifold is you're only monitoring it when you're monitoring it, right? You're not monitoring it while you're driving. You could hook that up and easily do that with a T-piece and a, a vacuum line probably up into the car and just you know look at your gauge watch it and see what it says. So my guess, Scott, for you is that you probably have a bad intake manifold and you may, in addition to that, have something going on with that vacuum system near the back of the vacuum pump. Take a good, hard visual look at that 
and see if there's any issues back there. We can also spray it with some leak detector, that kind of stuff, and see if we have any leaks. The only other thing I've seen do similar things is a broken camshaft. Um, but that was on the Gen 3 2 liter turbos, not the one that you have, so you shouldn't have to worry about that. All right, next one up is from Connor. Hey, Charles, when I started my apprenticeship, just over a year ago now, I had next to no experience or car knowledge. Since then, I feel like I've learned a ton, partly thanks to your channel. Appreciate that, dude. Great material, support, and insider knowledge. Although, I have been struggling with one thing. Back to basics. For some reason, when I'm given a multiple guess, he said multiple choice, but I would say multiple guess. Firing order question, I get real stuck. I'm okay on four-cylinder engines, but when it goes up to six, I really struggle. I have an upcoming gateway assessment. Anything you have on this would be an absolute lightsaver. Lightsaver. Lifesaver. Thanks again, Connor. Boy, am I struggling today. All right. Um, so there is no like true magic formula for calculating firing order because it really depends on how the engine was designed, you know, all of it, right? There's no magic thing. All you got to do is punch this in and every time you'll be correct. One of the things I really hate about those multiple guess questions is guys in over 15 years of having to work on cars, I've had to calculate the firing order of an engine this many times. I've had to look up the firing order of an engine a few times, but ultimately it's not something I ever had to know, which is why if there was a way, I have completely removed it from my brain. You mentioned on four cylinders, you're right. That's really easy because you have 360 degrees. So you have one fire every 90 degrees. You can kind of do the math on that and just see obviously how many times it's going to, or at what degree it's going to fire based on a 360 degree circle. Uh, there are some resources out there. I'll link you up to a PDF down in the, um, in the description that I found that kind of walks through a little bit of the basics of that and, and looking at firing order and maybe a better way to understand it. But there is no magic formula for calculating firing order based on the number of cylinders because it can vary based on crankshaft and you can change it based on crankshaft. Most four cylinders are really easy. One and four are companions, two and three are companions. But like you mentioned, when you get out to six, when you get out to eight, 10, 12, 13, 150 cylinders, uh, you can change that based on the crankshaft. While I truly believe that understanding the very basics of an engine is pretty important, and that kind of sets the ground floor foundation of everything else, right? We build that foundation, and then we build up on top of it and stack our knowledge. There's a lot of things that, unless you're doing things specific to, right? We're building a race engine specific to. That's why we need to order know the firing order. Or something like that. It's not a huge deal that you don't know. I'm not going to give you a hard time. There's plenty of other people out there that would definitely hate on me because, you know, I'm telling you, eh, I don't know, and I never really worried too much about it. Uh, there's plenty of people out there that'll feel that way and that'll bust on you for that too. But knowing that one thing, that one little thing, doesn't make you an excellent technician. It doesn't make you a terrible technician for not knowing it either. I would imagine, Connor, if you are having a test, you can probably go to one of your books on engine basics, and it'll probably tell you exactly. In fact, I would guess, this is how uh, some manufacturers do it, they actually pluck those kind of questions directly out of the book, out of the chapter, out of the page, on the topic. So if you find that, I'll bet you you find the answer they're looking for, which may or may not be the actual real world answer. And this kind of came to me too when uh, doing a lot of ASC stuff is they were asking me about vacuum controlled transmissions. Well, I don't know when the last time Volkswagen had a vacuum controlled transmission at all. It's not been on any of them that I've ever worked on. So I didn't care. So I took that knowledge and dumped it right out. I understand why they have them and what they can do. But as far as application, I've never had to apply it. So it just becomes a fact to memorize, to answer a question on a test. And uh, boy, does that kind of uh, sum up the average scholastic system as it lives today. But I won't go down that path because let's move on to another car question. All right, next one up is from Tyler, about 2.5 liter spark plugs. I was wondering what brand of plugs you found to run the best in the 2.5 liter engine. Reading on forums, it looks like people are either using factory VW, NJK, or Bosch plugs. Deutsche Auto shows two different ones for the Rabbit, depending on what year. One is factory, one is Bosch. Thanks. All right, Tyler, great question. A question I get all the time. What spark plug runs the best in my car? And you guys are going to be blown away, shocked, mind blown, 
about my answer. It's probably the one that Volkswagen says to put in your car. Believe it or not, the manufacturer has probably done more testing, more accurate testing that is, on spark plugs than any of the rest of us have ever done. Now, don't let me discourage you if you wanna do your own testing with 35 different spark plugs and what runs best in your car, I say go for it. And I say document those findings and post them because I would be very interested to see what happened. But ultimately it comes down to, from my experience, the best plugs are going to be the plugs that Volkswagen calls for. Now, understand that just because it ha doesn't have a VW emblem on the spark plug doesn't mean it's not the correct spark plug. If VW uses NGK plugs in a certain engine, NGK has that spark plug without the emblem on it. You might be able to save a couple bucks per plug on that. You might not. It might cost you exactly the same. It's very spark plug to spark plug. Same thing goes for Bosch. You can usually equate the VW part number to a Bosch number, and then if you wanna just buy the Bosch number, you go ahead and do that. For sake of time and ease, I just usually get the Volkswagen part number because, well, it's frankly easier. Over the years, I have seen so many cars come into the shop. Car misfiring, running rough, no acceleration, poor fuel economy, pull, you know, do your diagnostic tree, right? We pull our codes, we see what we got. Oh, misfires across all four cylinders. We look at the car, we don't see any major issues, no vacuum leaks or things like that. We pull a coil, we pull a plug, and what do you know, it's got an auto light spark plug in it. These plugs were installed because they're $1.50 a plug versus the NGK or Bosch ones, which are like 15 or 16, and shockingly, the car did not like it. So we drop four new correct plugs in, boom, fire the car up, and it runs perfectly. And just like that, the car is repaired. Unfortunately, that customer has spent money on getting the plugs done the first time, money on diagnosis for a misfire, and now money on the correct plugs again. So trying to save a couple bucks ended up costing them quite a bit more, which I have also seen a ton of times. So dude, I would go with whatever the factory plug is. It's the easiest way to think about it. Now there is a couple of exceptions. If your car's modified heavily, right? Beyond exhaust intake, that kind of stuff. If your engine is modified, then yeah, you're probably going to be looking at a different spark plug. And this information should be coming from the people that have provided the parts to modify and tune your car. Uh, if you're doing it all yourself, well, you probably have way more expertise in spark plugs than I ever will, So you and you wouldn't be asking me this question um, on a video. So, uh, you know, if you're in that expert category, then awesome, you've done your own testing. But for the most part, it's either gonna be VW factory or whatever manufacturer car you have, right? This is not just Volkswagen, it's everybody. Uh, or whatever, if your car's modified, whatever your tuner is recommending for spark plugs. And even then, if we get to a point where we're not satisfied with that, now we can begin doing our own testing, looking at power, looking at fuel economy, looking at engine smoothness, if that's what we're looking at as an indicator of whether a spark plug is good or not. So dude, go with the factory ones, it's the easiest way to do it. No use trying to reinvent the wheel. VW did plenty of testing on this for us when it comes to spark plugs. And if you guys are running a 2.5 and have found a better spark plug, drop it down in the comments and let us know because I could be off a little bit on that one. But by and large, for the most part, drop the factory ones in. It's gonna be the easiest, fastest way to do it. All right, last one of the day comes from John. Hey Charles, I'm getting a P2178 OBD System 2 Rich off idle on Bank One code on my 2010 Passat. Should I replace the MAF sensor first? Your channel rocks, John in Michigan. John, great question. System rich is always a really weird one to, to pop up because 96% of the time it's gonna be system lean and that 4% system rich is usually extra challenging because you don't deal with it every day. But I will say, I would not recommend doing the math first. I would recommend doing a couple of tests. Now, you may not have all this test equipment that I'm gonna talk about today. Some of it's very inexpensive if you wanted to purchase it. I'll link up a couple things we talk about down on, uh, on Amazon down below, but, um, Guys, try and move off, and this is something I see all the time because I do get so many questions, and I'm not picking on John at all because this is a legit thing. Um, it's we come for help after we've replaced like $800 worth of parts, and we're mad because we spent all this money on parts and our car's still doing the same thing when like $85 of diagnostic charge would have saved us three, four, five, six hundred bucks. So um, don't immediately go to shotgunning parts into a car, that goes for DIYers, that goes for you professionals out there as well that like to just load up the parts cannon. I think that's two weeks in a row with a parts cannon reference. 
and blast all the parts. Another way to say that is drive it through the parts department. So John, what can we do? Very first thing we need to do is evaluate the vehicle, right? You have system too rich off idle. I would wanna know how rich, is it a little too rich? Is it a lot too re rich? Um, and for those of you that don't know, system rich means too much fuel or not enough air in the system. Too much fuel is a very legit possibility too little air is probably less likely. What I have seen cause this problem is in-tank fuel pumps, fuel filters. Fuel filter is probably the number one thing. You don't have a serviceable one on that Passat, so you'd be putting a pump unit in it anyway. Um, the, the fuel pump control module, I've seen cause that as well. I've seen high pressure fuel pumps cause that as well. Basically all the fuel system parts I've seen cause this issue. Never ever a math. The other thing we wanna look at, John, is this paired with any other faults. Do you have a misfire on cylinder three with this? Okay, well, maybe we have an injector that's leaking, which is very possible. In fact, there's a warranty extension on that generation vehicle because of that. So you wanna look at that too. But please don't just shotgun a math into it. As far as the not enough air, or it's not going to be not enough air so much unless it is like someone left a rag in the intercooler or something like that. Uh, we want to look at PCV because PCV, that disruption in pressure can cause weird issues like a system rich fault. Um, John, I would really recommend, especially because you might still have some warranty left on this car, take it in and get it diagnosed. If you wanted to do some of this diagnosis yourself, get a fuel pressure gauge and we're going to measure fuel pressure where it comes up into the hood, right? There's a quick connection right by the coolant bottle. We're going to measure it out of the uh, fuel pump in the tank as well and it should be exactly the same uh, because there's nothing in between, right? It's just a line, but we wanna make sure that the fuel pressure coming out of the pump is good. We wanna look at the fuel pump control module and make sure it's the latest revision of said fuel pump control module. Call your local VW dealership and see if you have any campaigns open on your car because you might have a recall for that, uh, or a campaign, I should say, for that uh, fuel pump control module. And if that's the case, that fuel pump control module that's supposed to pulse with modulate the pump may just be deadheading the pump and now it's just blasting fuel all the time. You'd probably be getting a system rich at idle fault, not so much off idle, but it could be wonky there. Let me put it to you this way as well. I've seen zero of those airflow meters fail on that generation car. Mark IV, B5, all the time every day, but pretty much from there up, the airflow meters have been really, really good and not nearly as problematic as they, uh, they had been before that. Uh, you wanna look at your PCV system. I would look there, make sure it's good. That's another super common failing part. So there's a lot of parts that really could be an issue. And unfortunately, without some kind of test equipment, I'd be using the scan tool very heavily here as well. Uh, you're gonna really struggle. You're gonna really struggle to find exactly what's wrong unless you just randomly stumble across what's, what's going on. But um, this is a tough one to just do without any kind of test equipment. System lean is way easier. Do you got an oil leak? Do you got an air leak? Is there a crack in the intercooler? Is some kind of pipe broken? Boom, there's your fault most likely. But system rich can be a little weird. I think also, as I'm saying these words, there might have been an issue with turbochargers at the wastegate where it goes into the exhaust housing where it gets wonky and actually separates a little bit. I think that could cause a system rich as well. So you wanna look at that. Also the exhaust, if you have the exhaust loose or there's a crack in the, um, the flex section, seeing that cause system lean and rich faults at the same time, which makes no sense, but it's basically tweaking out the uh, oxygen sensor with uh, extra weird air and extra weird disturbance. So John, I wish I had a, hey man, replace that airflow meter, it'll fix it for you. But unfortunately this is not one of those cases. This one's gonna take some digging. And without that equipment that you really need to do said digging, it's gonna be extra challenging as a DIY job. All right guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. Questions, comments, drop them down below. Like the video, thumbs up, always appreciate that. Don't forget there is an audio only version of this show as well if you'd rather listen than watch. Guys, thank you so much for listening or watching and I'll see you next time.